Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's webinar on meeting your production goals, record keeping for animal health and performance. My name is Ellen Crane, I'm the Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. This session will last for approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions you have for us during the question and answer period. If you are on Twitter, you can follow along, tweet along with us using the hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording the session this evening, and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss anything or you want to review something, you can go back and do that. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window on your control panel. If you have a question or comment for me, or either are the presenters, that's the place to do so. And feel free to send in questions at any point during the presentations. We will answer all of those at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close other programs that are using the internet, as well as close the webcam window, which means you won't be able to see us, but hopefully the sound will come through a bit more clear for you. So with that, let's get rolling. This is what we will be covering tonight. You'll hear from two speakers on the webinar this evening. They will be talking about animal health and performance records, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Before I hand things over to Kathy, I wanted to take a moment to give a quick overview of some of the resources that we have available on beefresearch.ca. We recently launched a number of modules uh, that cover record keeping and benchmarking for beef producers. This is uh, available in different levels. So if you feel like you may be more of a beginner record keeper or you're looking for something a little bit more advanced, there may be something there for you. Uh, one of the modules in particular co covers animal health and performance records. As you will see on your right hand of your screen, that's an example of one of the types of records and kind of the setup for the records that we have available in the resources. So talking about um, growth of calves, for example, so weaning weights um, and giving you a number of benchmarks for those, um, the data to record, when to record it and why it's important to do that. There's some other indicators that are available on uh, the resources on our website. Um, many of these will be covered this evening by Kathy and Tyler, but if you're interested in checking these out later on, you can find them on beefresearch.ca under the resources tab. So with that, I'll move on to our first speaker for this evening. Kathy Larson is a professional research associate in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Saskatchewan. Prior to joining the U of S in 2018, she was the beef economist for the Western Beef Development Center for eight years. Her current research and extension interests include cost of production, adoption of recommended management practices, the value of record keeping and the economic impact of leafy spurge. She also provides economic analysis for research conducted by faculty and graduate students at the Livestock and Forge Center of Excellence. Originally from a beef and grain farm near Francis in southeastern eastern Saskatchewan, she now calls Prince Albert home. Tonight, Kathy will be speaking about animal health and performance record keeping and benchmarking. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Kathy. All right, thanks, Ellen. I'm just gonna share my screen here and we'll get started. All right. I hope everyone can see my uh, my slideshow and thanks so much for that lovely introduction and so glad to be here this evening with everybody. Um, I have a few poll questions interspersed in my presentation, four of them to be exact, and we're going to start off with one just to get things started. Um, and here is your options. If you keep production records, how are they stored? You have three options to pick from. So is it paper primarily? electronic or do you have a, a decent combination of both? So I'll give you a couple seconds here to select your option. And I'm not sure when we make the call, Ellen, if you want to, is there, can you see how many votes have come in? I can, yeah, we'll just wait another second. Okay. 
Okay, so it'll end there. So I think, can you see the results there? Yeah, so we have um, paper 34%, electronic 10%, but yeah, good, a good uh, portion of you over half indicating that you do collect both, which is not too surprising. I think there's this need and Tyler's gonna touch on that as well of having that safety net with a paper and then you get it into electronic format afterwards. I have a couple, um, a slide here that shows you a graphic across Canada. We've done some surveys um, through the different provinces and regions in Canada over the last few years to ask about the use of or the collection of records. And what I want you to take away from this graphic is yes, most producers are collecting some sort of records. Um, I would stress and, uh, you know, I'm maybe pe preaching a little bit to the choir here with over half of you having uh, more than half of you having electronic records of some sort, they do, they're a lot easier to analyze in that format. Um, you can see though that paper still is king for um, Ontario with, uh, you know, 88% of respondents saying that they have paper records. So that you, that safety that comes with paper records, but we do start seeing the shift to electronic. My second question for you. So we're getting two out of the way up here up front. You it should pop up on your screen. Um, we want to know, are you satisfied with your current uh, record keeping system or the software that you're using uh, for managing your app, your animal records. So you have four options to choose from. Yes, it works great. It's okay, but there's room for improvement. No, it's not really working for us or we don't have a system for managing animal records. So those are your four options to pick from. Hopefully one ends up uh, suiting you best. You can pick one of those four. And we'll give you a, a few seconds here to make that selection. I think just a couple more seconds here. All right. Oh, a few of you think it's works. It's working great, um, but the, the most popular was it's okay, but room for improvement. I think that's always a good a good position to be in, as I think there's always room for improvement in everything that we do. A few of you say uh, no, something's not really working. So you know you, you can ask questions here tonight. Um, Tyler is going to be showing you what he's doing on his operation. Uh, we don't have a system for managing records. Well, you can hear some options here tonight, and maybe there's something you can take away to apply on your own operation. Okay, thanks for those uh, for that feedback on that poll question. We'll have a couple more interspersed here. As Ellen mentioned, I used to work for the Western Beef Development Center and I would work with producers on their cost of production. And in doing that, you know, I came to realize that, uh, and this probably no surprise to many of you, you know, we have really low margins as cow-calf producers and low rates of return. So when we look at the profit equation where we're getting revenues for our calves, that's our primary source of revenue as a cow-calf producer in our costs, we often want to turn to, well, if only the calf prices would increase, um, things would be better profit-wise. Um, you know, I would suggest that a shift to looking at your unit cost of production or your break even on calves, your cost per pound of wean calves is probably more uh, of a better approach. And so um, your break even price on calves, we actually call that your unit cost of production. You take your total cow herd costs and divide by your total pounds of calf weaned. And so that's not your average wean weight, that's all the, the pounds that you have um, for market. And by doing that, you end up taking into consideration your overall production efficiency, right? What influences your pounds of calf wean? Well, your conception rate, your calf death loss, your calving distribution, the way that you manage your herd all plays into what you end up to have for pounds, uh, pounds to market at the end of your calving season or end of your uh, calf crop when you're weaning off your calves. And in fact, there's research out there that would say that producers who focus on their unit cost of production, they're consistently more profitable. So that's my background and my interest in getting producers comfortable with capturing their records. So I think that, um, you know, we probably all agree records are important and, um, 
the Beef Cattle Research Council uses research by a young gentleman by the name of Ma Monglai. He surveyed producers that were part of the disease surveillance network um, that was funded by the Beef Cattle Research Council. And he asked producers as part of that network, can you tell me a little bit about your record keeping and your use of benchmarking? And what uh, Monglai found was that the producers who were using record keeping and benchmarking they had improved performance, quite considerable improved performance, an additional 60 pounds of calf weaned per female exposed. So it does pay off. What can you use records for? Well, a number of things, and in no particular order here, obviously for informed decisions. So, um, you know, making decisions on which females to call, which uh, matings, which bulls you're going to be pairing up with which females, uh, which heifers to retain for selection. Um, you might use your records if you're having a bit of a, uh, an issue with some herd health, you want to be able to troubleshoot. So is this a, a one-off year or can I see uh, things in the past that would indicate I'm going to, that there's a, a pattern repeating here that I need to, to deal with, with uh, some veterinary help. Um, as I've already expressed, I think that records are really important, both production and financial, to do budgeting and figuring out your cost of production. Uh, records are needed for tracking goals, so you should be setting goals for yourself and obviously to evaluate your progression towards those goals, you're going to need records of some sort. And lastly, uh, value added marketing. So if you're a purebred producer, um, maybe that's the, you need that records in order to market your seed stock, um, but it could also be that you're looking to maybe market to the EU or be part of the Verified Beef Production Plus program that requires records in order to, to take part of those options. What do you use production records for? So this is our third poll question. So based on that previous list I just showed, we're going to pop up a little poll question here for you. Pick as many of those that pertain to your operation. So when you think about records that you're collecting on your operation, what are you using the records for, if anything? And if there isn't one of those ones that fits, you can also pick other at the bottom. So there's several to pick from. You can pick as many of them that pertains to your um, operation. So you have culling decisions, replacement selection, marketing or verified beef production, or you know, could be selling breeding stock, uh, reporting to breed associations, so that'd be more about uh, EPB, EPD generation, do you use it for cost of production, tracking goals, benchmarking, or other. And you can pick as many, select all that apply to your, your operation. Okay. Where are we at, Alan? I think it's starting to slow down a bit here. There was a bit more reading in that one. Oh, yes. Just getting a couple more trickle in here. Let's give you another second to get your answers in. Calling decisions, that's really a, a, a key one. Replacement selections. I'm not surprised that those ones float to the top. Um, marketing, 40% breed associations, 26% cost of production. Right on, great, thanks. I wish there was an op a way for me to have you specify what the other is, but I'll have to figure that out another time. So thanks everybody for that. All right. So records they need to be analyzed so i think that we would all say yeah i, I collect records it's good to see you give some evidence of how you're using those records because what's the point right why would you collect records if you're not going to be using them um, so we know that producers are collecting records they need to be used to make uh, calculations and decisions on your operations you've all shared ways that you're doing that on your operation 
Uh, one thing is that we have, we tend to have lots of herd level measures, but it takes a little bit more effort or perhaps considerable more effort, depending on how you look at it, to track that individual female's lifetime productivity. But as you progress through what you want to be measuring and monitoring on your operation, you might start shifting that way is that you want to get more and more detail and you'll know a certain female's entire um, all her progeny and how she's how much pounds she's produced over her lifetime. Uh, I would really recommend that you do year over year analysis and I'm, I'm guessing that many of you I'm probably speaking a bit to the choir that you're you're looking at your numbers from year to year, uh, maybe a couple times a year and where possible, can you compare to some benchmarks, you know there's benchmarks that Ellen's already referred to on the beef cattle research council. There's also a production indicator tool that uh, BCRC has that has uh, regional and industry target benchmarks. Uh, pre-populated into it and we'll make sure that that comes out um, in an email with you with you guys about the, the recording for this presentation you can see um, those values benchmarks I mean they really help you figure out am I on the right track is there somewhere that I could make some improvements am I a leader in a certain area um, in a couple of years ago I worked with a couple colleagues to survey producers about which indicators and measures they were tracking on their operations. And um, you'll see that there's four options showing on this graph. There's open rate, calving distribution, uh, pounds wean per female exposed, and wean weight as a percentage of dam weight. Obviously, as we progress rightward through those options, there's more and more records required in order to to calculate that measure. And then it should be no surprise when we ask producers, okay, are you tracking this measure? We see declining rates of tracking as the more data you need. The last two, you need to be getting um, wean weights um, on your calves and dam weights as well for that wean weight as a percentage of dam weight. Another thing that, that sticks out for me from this is just, the disconnect between tracking a measure and then comparing it towards a goal. I, I would recommend that you set goals for yourself for your operation. They don't have to be goals that are posted out somewhere. They can be the ones that you set for yourself. It can be based on industry targets, but it certainly can be something that you think is achievable for your own operation. And so with that, I have a one last poll question for you. Um, of the previous indicators that you just saw on that slide, um, which of them do you track on your operation? So um, pick all that apply. Do you track your open or your conception rate? Do you calculate your calving distribution? We really want 60% of our females to have calved in the first 21 days of the calving season. Do you track calf crop percentage? Uh, do you track pounds weaned per female exposed or wean weight as a percentage of dam weight? So again, you can select all that you measure on your operation. give you a little bit more time here. Ellen can see how many have responded. And the responses are starting to slow down here. Just another second. Okay. Okay. Nearly everybody. Yeah, that's some low hanging fruit, right? Getting your measuring your conception rate. Calving distribution is higher than I expected, calf crop percentage. Yeah, and then we have that typical tailing off when it requires the, 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 the wean weight, uh, the actual scale weights, I'm guessing is part of the reason, but I'd be interested to hear feedback as to why those measures, you don't track those. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, let's keep going along here. So now that I've talked a bit about why you could how you could use records i've asked you about that which type of indicators are you uh collecting on your operation let's now shift into uh, some suggested areas uh measures that you could track and then uh, 
benchmarks to consider. So Ellen's already mentioned this, the Beef Cattle Research Council released record keeping modules last year and they're level one, two and three. Uh, Tyler and I are looking to, to give you a, a little bit of sense of records associated with animal health and performance here tonight. And um, you know, right in level one of the Beef Cattle Research Council's uh, record keeping modules is the gold production indicators. And you may, many of you may very well be familiar with these or G uh, stands for growth and it has to do with indicators associated with wean weight. So, um, you know, wean weight is a percentage of dam weight as we've just talked about, um, total pounds of calf weaned, wean weight per female exposed, weight per day of age. Those are all different metrics that you can um, figure out to do with uh, the G, the growth weight or the wean weight of your calves. O stands for opens and, um, you know, I've seen different indicators or targets for this. Um, I'm, I've shown you one that's in line with Western Canadian data. So 7% open on cows, 10% um, on heifers. And that would be on a breeding season that's 63 days or less. Length pertains to, L pertains to length or calving season length. So 60 to 80 days, that's been a long standing industry target is to have a, a calving season of no more than 80 days. And D stands for death loss on calves. So um, this is in line with Western Canadian values of uh, having a death loss on calves under 4%. A common measure is calf crop percentage. I asked you guys who's who's taking that measure. How is that calculated? How I would define that it's calculated is number of calves weaned divided by number of females exposed. The suggested target is 85%. And I'm gonna show you an example with some data, but I always think it's really important. There's lots of different terms being used for various indicators. It's really important to make sure that you're not comparing apples to oranges, that you're making sure that the way that you calculate your indicator and the one that you're comparing to have been calculated in the same way. And there are formulas out there. I'm referring uh, for this example to some information put out by University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, where calf crop, um, for this example, we have 300 females exposed. You can see the, the little bit of uh, discussion right at the top of the example of how many calves are dying how many are weaned, 250 weaned or 55 weaned divided by 300 females exposed, we end up with a calf crop of 85%. It's just a perfect example that aligns with that suggested target. But if you have your numbers uh, correctly calculated or your ratios correctly calculated, you can multiply conception rate by calving rate and wean rate and you multiply those values together and it will equal calf crop percentage. So that can always be a quick check when you even are looking at posted benchmarks. Okay, are those values, how do they correct, calculate those? Well, if they're multiplied together, they should equal calf crop and it's a check for your own numbers as well. Okay. Um, in terms of breeding records to keep, so I would suggest be writing it down somewhere on your calendar, put it in as, as a, a, some sort of entry in your phone, what your bull turnout date so that you have a, an idea of when you're going to uh, start calving. Um, females exposed, it's really important to capture that. You know, most of you have said that you're, you have your conception rate or your open rate, that's some, an indicator that you're tracking. So uh, you're tra taking that number down, writing it somewhere, um, that you can refer back to uh, right at the start of breeding season would be ideal. How many females ended up bred and open? Obviously, you know, preaching to the choir here, many of you have indicated that this is an indicator that you are tracking for your herds. Uh, number of bulls used, you write that down. Do you have any bulls you've used so that you can figure out your cow to bull ratio? And how about breeding fields? Is that something that you're tracking so that you know which bulls were with which females? Um, you know, if you want to be using multi-sire parentage testing, you obviously need to know, um, it helps the lab to know which are the prospective sires um, when you're doing any sort of uh, parentage testing. So is that something that you track on your operations that you can refer back to? In terms of calving records, um, we probably all have a pocket calving book. You might be running short on supply because we haven't really had a lot of opportunities to get them at trade shows and what have you. Um, but some data that's out there from Alan Alberta study says that, you know, 
over 90% of producers are, are calculating or capturing some level of records at calving. And, you know, is that for your operation, the actual birth date or just a range of birth dates, the, the start and end date for your, for your calving season? Um, do you, are you able to know how many calves are born, how many calf death loss, uh, calves that you lost to death, um, how many calves are weaned, do you track calving ease, um, are you capturing a birth weight or a wean weight, and Tyler will touch on that and how he does that for his operation, are those measures that you could use, uh, judging by some of you saying that you don't have indicators on wean weights, um, and suspecting that you're not capturing a wean weight or you'd have to pull it off of a sales slip. Um, do you use some sort of naming convention where you have an uh, individual animal ID for each calf and that's somehow linked to the dam as well? Is that something that you would see as value or something that you're doing on your operation so that you can track those uh, uh, calf performance and tie it to each dam? In terms of animal health records, as I already mentioned, you need to have records for participation in the verified beef production program. As a cow-calf producer, you need to submit six months of records. Feedlots, it's three months. So you want to be tracking your animal ID, um, your treatment date that's needed for your withdrawal, weight or withdrawal date, your treatment reason. I think that that's valuable to know why you're treating those animals. So if, if there's something that keeps popping up, you can talk with your vet when you're developing your herd or revising your herd health protocols. What product did you use? What's the dosage, the route? Were there any incidents of uh, suspected broken needles? Um, you know, can you track if there's animals dying or that you've had to euthanize? Do you re record the date, the animal ID and the reason that that animal or suspected reason that that animal died? So with that, just some closing comments before we shift to Tyler showing uh, record keeping in action. Uh, production performance, as I've already shared, it, it impacts your break even, your unit cost of production, and therefore your profitability. So it's really important to have good records. You've probably all heard the adage, you cannot manage what you do not measure. I really recommend um, setting goals for yourself. If you establish those goals, it'll give you more sense of, okay, what measures do I need to track and how can I use that data then to measure the progression towards achieving those goals? Um, record keeping, no doubt, uh, collecting records and analyzing them takes time. Any of you who've listened to uh, the webinar from back in November with Brett McRae, he talked how he dedicates a couple mornings a week to working on the business where he's doing budgeting and looking over his, uh, his numbers and his data. Electronic records, you know, uh, again, a number of you have already shared that you do have some of your records in electronic format that certainly makes them easier to analyze and apply in decision making. And lastly, where you can, there are benchmarks out there for our industry, comparing with them will help you figure out and assess whether or not you're on the right track, but you can always do self benchmarking as well. And with that, thanks for your time. And I look forward to questions at the end of the session. And that's my contact information. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kathy. If any of you have questions for Kathy, or if you think of some questions as we go further along in the presentation, feel free to drop those into the Q&A or into the chat. And we'll answer those at the end of the hour. Next. Our next speaker will be Tyler Fulton. Tyler owns and operates Titan Farm, a 650 head cow-calf backgrounding operation in Brittle, Manitoba. After receiving an agribusiness degree from the University of Manitoba and working in the field of livestock risk management, he returned to the family farm in 2007. Over the last 13 years, the operation has doubled its herd and adopted a corn-based winter grazing system and has diversified its marketing to include EU certification, Verify Beef Production Plus, and antibiotic slash growth promoting free programs. Tyler farms with his wife, Darrell, and their children, Evan and May. Tonight, Tyler will be speaking about his operations application of record keeping for animal health and performance. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tyler. Okay, I'll just uh, struggle with uh, <laughs> connecting up here and we'll see how to go. How about that, can you see that? Yes, I can. 
Okay. Um, well, thanks for um, thanks for having me and for uh, for tuning in. Um, as Ellen said, uh, we're in in Bertle, Manitoba. Um, that's the western side of the province, and I guess I don't need to go through a whole bunch more. Uh, she she kind of covered um, kind of the, the the brief history of our our farm operation. Um, we're pretty much exclusively a, a cow calf operation, um, running a, a commercial herd. And, uh, and I'm going to reiterate the fact that we, uh, we have been involved with uh, antibiotic uh, and growth promoting free programs, uh, as well as uh, EU certified programs and, uh, and VBP plus. And, and so I mentioned that because that's uh, partly what motivates um, some of the record keeping and the, and the uh, I guess the evolution of our of our records um, over the course of the last few years or so. So what I plan to do here is just run through kind of um, our some of the processes that we go through, and then um, and then be able to discuss how we're using the data um, to to help make decisions better. So first off, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna share uh, something that we've uh, started using this year, uh, and that is a Google Sheet. Um, so Google Sheet is a spreadsheet, um, and until this year, we used, uh, we used Excel. So our calving process works a little bit like this. Um, we bring in the animals. We're typically uh, tagging them with a dangle tag and RFID. We'll rate the, the cows uh, based on their uh, we'll score the cows based on their teat and udder and feet, um, and we'll weigh all of the calves, um, and then um, castrate uh, the males typically, and, uh, and just record any other information that we think is pertinent. Um, and so this, uh, this is uh, our 2020 calving book. The process goes something like this. My parents are, are, are still involved in the operation. And, and in particular, my dad does um, a lot of the, the calving uh, process, the, the recording and, and, and tagging and weighing and so on. And so um, he prefers the, the uh, paper and pencil. So um, what, what worked out this year, especially with all the help that we had during, um, during the COVID outbreak, was uh, my my dad would uh, would be taking down this information, and my daughter would go and input the information um, into the Google Sheet. Um, and once it's in the Google Sheet, it's accessible to anybody that you want to have access to it. And so for us, that included um, my sister, who was um, who was out during COVID, and uh, our hired hand, um, who. Uh, who needs to have access to it as well so that we can monitor calves and, and make sure that uh, we can immediately find their mothers if there's a mix up or, or anything like that. And so it was just really invaluable that as immediately after it was updated, um, I'd have all the information at my fingertips. So this year we had a little bit of a problem um, in the spring uh, in that we had um, we had some scour, uh, a scour outbreak. And, and, and so that resulted in us um, having to treat uh, probably about uh, 20 calves or so, maybe 30 calves. Um, and so quickly we, we were able to use the, the Google Sheet uh, to help manage that process. Um, previously, we were always using paper records to be able to record all the information that we needed to. Um, and suddenly it made it just a whole lot more sense to just have it all um, available on your phone. And so if I was out checking, uh, you know, checking animals and I feel, uh, and I needed to, to treat a, a particular calf, then I would be able to um, go on my phone, um, record exactly um, what the calf, who the calf was, where, and it automatically populated um, the herd that it was in. And then it would bring uh, uh, bring up a, a pull down list of all the products that you know that we wanted to use or that we could possibly use, and the method of uh, of treatment. Um, 
and then of course the date that that happened. And so what would happen automatically is the, sh um, and I, I guess I guess I need to be um, clear up front here. It was largely my wife that's been doing the um, the uh, development of the spreadsheets. She's a trained accountant and um, and has kind of been part of the operation, especially on the on the record keeping front and the analysis. Um, so I can't claim um, I can't claim that this uh, these were all uh, my ideas or or my my good work. Anyways, um, so. What happens is when you punch in um, that you use a particular um, product, um, it will it will automatically populate what the withdrawal period is, and then and then generate what when the um, when that withdrawal period is up. Uh, and so, as part of the VBP Plus program, um, you need to be able to show that you um, that you checked the animals that were sold to make sure that there weren't any animals that were going for slaughter or could go for slaughter um, that were still within a withdrawal period. And so um, for us, what that looks like is, um, is just choosing an event called sold slash withdrawal times checked. And so it's really easy for me to be able to say, okay, um, I've got these animals on, um, that uh, that I've sold, or these you know these culled animals that I've sold, um, what uh, and these are the animals that are on the truck. When was the last? Uh, when is the last withdrawal period um, up? And so, as long as there were no dates that were later than what I had, um, than what the date that I was shipping was, then I was good to go. Um, and and that I I think believe, I believe that satisfies the VBP plus um, criteria. So um, one of the other uh, things that we do on our farm um, is that we we tag not only with a dangle tag but with an RFID, and that um, allows the animal um, that allows us to better I guess keep or maintain the identity of the animal. And that's a requirement for the EU certification program. Um, and so what they're largely concerned about is not being fed um, grow, uh, not being fed um, a beta agonist or a growth promotant uh, in, in any way. And so they're very concerned that, you know, for example, if you only had one single tag um, in, and it lost the tag, then how how can I know what the uh, identity of that animal is? And so um, with the use of an RFID, I can cross um, reference the RFID number in the event that a calf has lost its dangle tag or vice versa, and then re-tag it. Um, so that's, that's kind of how, um, how, we use, how, how we use it that way. Um, <clears throat> I think that's pretty much it. I guess um, just following up with some of what Kathy was talking about. So for years, um, we've we've always kind of weighed uh, at birth and weighed at weaning, um, and so we've always had a, a plethora of data um, that we could reference if if we wanted to figure out if you know if there if we were having trouble or if there was um, if there was a problem, and I think. Um, what's motivated us to kind of move towards a, an electronic based system is, is the fact that we've grown our herd roughly about 150 cows over the last, uh, over the last three or four years and um, calving, the calving period is, is a pretty busy period as it is for everybody. And I think probably what, what a lot of operations do is they start just not recording some of that information. And, and for me, that just, that wasn't really a, a palatable option. I didn't want to go without everything that we've, uh, that we've collected. Uh, and so, um, and so I think that's probably what's, what's kind of progressed. So we use the, uh, we use the information then to, um, to figure out what uh, the, we go and apply what the weaning weights are for every animal. And then we, uh, from that, calculate uh, a weight gain uh, per day of age. 
Um, and so uh, when we were marketing some steers in the in the fall, um, I actually got on Twitter and, and shared this, uh, this information. Um, and you can see um, that this is a histogram of the weight gain uh, per day of age from birth to weaning. Okay, so it gives us a perspective as to how consistent um, the calves are gaining uh, across, the, across the whole herd. Okay, so here's a couple of examples, I guess, of, of how we're using the data. I mean, that's one thing and it's, it's a nice thing. That's the really interesting thing about Google Sheets. When, when you've got your phone available, um, there's an explore feature that automatically will generate some of these graphs like that. And I'm not sure how it does it, but it, it, nine times out of 10, it's, it's valuable and, and pertinent information. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really cool little perk of, of Google Sheets. Um, okay, so first off, I guess uh, what, what we uh, typically have always used it for is, um, is, is using the, the data to help decide which replacements. Um, so what we do is we put all that data into the, into the spreadsheet and, um, and make a pivot table so we can kind of slice and dice the information by any field. So this is an example of, uh, of effectively the replacement heifers from 2019. Um, so you can say um, we set these criteria that are minimum criteria, such as mothers that have teat and utter scores of, uh, of one, um, birth weights that are between 65 and 95 pounds, um, and that calved within the first two heat cycles, um, or sorted um, and, and sorted on weight gain per day of age. So all of that information is right there available and it effectively can give me, depending on how I wanna rank each of those fields, um, a, a ranked list of kind of the best to the worst heifer that I should keep for replacement. The other thing that's really important is just making sure that I have it accessible when I'm actually out sorting the animals. Um, of course, you can't just go by paper and expect that that animal is going to be what you need to keep as a replacement. You need to take into consideration those phenotypic um, traits. And, uh, and so consequently, we have, uh, we have that data available to us by calf number. So it's easily referenced. I can just say, okay, uh, that's G52 and look at, uh, look at what the stats are on her. And if she looks good and the stats look good, you know, then she's a, then she's a keep. Okay, um, moving uh, back to the Google Sheet this year, or uh, we brought in a whole bunch of other information actually. Um, that uh, from past years. And I thought that this was maybe one that, um, that uh, some of you might find interesting. So we, um, we, for the last couple of years, have treated our calves uh, with a product called Long Range. And what that is, is an injectable ivermectin um, that is like a slow release. Um, and the concept is that ivermectin on the poron um, it had it, it's effective, but it's it, it doesn't last as long. And so I think the I, I'm not sure exactly what the total length of time is, but it um, it really uh, extends the life of the protection for pests. Um, and so what we wanted to do the first year we went and and did an experiment, and we did a control group where there was no um, there was no poron being applied to the to the control group and we would provide um, a, uh, the injectable long range product. And what we realized is that it was, it gained, though those animals ended up gaining about 15 pounds more than the ones that didn't have, didn't receive anything. So then the following year we decided, oh, we better, we better compare what the poron product uh, treatment would be versus the, the, the um, injectable one. And so um, it, it, this does kind of provide some perspective on that. So um, the difference is only about 0.05 pounds per gain of gain per day. 
Now, to put this in perspective, it was only 50, um, 50 days. And um, from the time that we treated to the time that we weighed for weaning. Um, so it really doesn't capture the whole perspective. And of course, they'd, they'd already grown probably 250 pounds uh, before we'd even treated them. Um, at the end of the day, um, we decided that uh, it, it does make sense. I think it definitely pays for itself and it does make sense, especially if you are intending to, uh, to hold on to those animals um, so that you have that longer, um, longer benefit. Okay, um, one other way that we use the data uh, to, um, to help make decisions um, is we, all of our, um, our land is set up so that it's in different groups, um, different clusters. And so um, what we were able to do is take all of the average daily gains from each of the herds that go to the different pasture paddocks and uh, compare them. And so for the last 10 years, we've got average daily gain of calves by pasture. Um, and what that allows us to do is maybe gives us some perspective as to whether or not we should be renovating a pasture stand um, that might have, you know, a low amount of alfalfa in it or a low legume content versus, uh, versus a straight one. And it, and it determines maybe whether or not a, a native pasture is, um, there's a cost or, or a benefit um, to the native grasses that are in that versus, um, versus a, a, a seeded um, a seeded variety of, of pasture. So just what uh, to, to provide some a little bit of uh, context here, this group here, Newshams, um, is probably the most consistent, um, consistent pasture in terms of putting out um, decent gains on calves. And I would say that that pasture has the largest legume content in, in of all of the the options listed here. The Valley Group is uh, largely a uh, largely a native pasture, um, and it's uh, it's different because there's a ton of woodland. Um, and but you can see that over you know over the time horizon, there's not a great deal of uh, of variation. The other thing that this can can show us is um, is the degree to which um, droughts can have, uh, can have an impact on your, um, on your average daily gains. Okay, I think the, the last project that I, I'm not going to show you anything about today, but um, what we're working on now is, is trying to get some perspective as to the, what the top 50 calves, or top 50 cows are. And so we're trying to use the data and uh, apply a weighting to all of the different fields like you would want to apply, such as fertility uh, based on the calving date and longevity based on the age of the cow and uh, productivity, the average daily gain and, um, and quality attributes of the animal like, um, like teat and udder and feet scores. Um, so that's still a work in progress, but um, the idea here is is just to uh, to continue to kind of learn and improve. Last, uh, I wanted to give you a, just a quick peek at what the intention is um, for this coming year, uh, and that is um, got a really good idea from Kathy on on one of our calls leading up to the uh, to to this webinar. Um, and that is to instead, we're going to try uh, to um, change the calving process a little bit so that we're going to use Google Forms to generate uh, the data. So to facilitate, I guess, the ease with which the data gets put into the system. And so what we'll do is um, we're going to run through. I'll just do a, a quick example here. I'm going to punch in um, a, a tag number, T. Uh, Oh, sorry. I'm gonna switch to edit uh, out of edit mode and into uh, into the the effectively it's just a questionnaire of all the questions that you'd want to that you'd want to include, and so um, 
uh, I'll call it T36 yellow. Uh, the calf number is calf number eight. It's, uh, let's call it a female. It weighed uh, 85 pounds. It had horns, had a teat and utter score of uh, one and a feet score of two. And then you can add any comment. I mean, you can customize this as easy, you know, um, with a ton of ease. It's it's really super easy. And so uh, once you've submitted that, it instantly gets um, put into the Google Sheet. And um, and you can see here, this is um, this is the uh, the one we just placed put in there. So that's kind of where we're going. And I thank Kathy for that idea because um, hopefully it will, uh, it will just make it a little bit quicker. I think I went well over my time here and I hope, uh, I hope that covers everything. And I'd love to hear some questions if, uh, if there are some. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. So yes, now we will take your questions. And I know that there have been some that have started to roll in already, but feel free to, answer, or to enter your questions into the Q&A. And you'll find that either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Uh, Tyler, I know one of the first questions I saw was, uh, can you use your Google Sheets offline? Um, and I know we discussed this before the webinar. Um, but are, do you need cell service to use it? Have you can you use it offline? Yes. Um, so that uh, that's an absolute critical thing. Our our, um, our cell service is is terrible, as I'm sure most uh, people's are, um, and so it's absolutely critical that I'm able to access the sheet. And so there is a, I guess there's a version on my phone, and then I can. Uh, what happens is. I can make uh, changes and modify any of the data that's in it. And as soon as I regain access to a cell signal or Wi-Fi, it automatically updates. And, um, and there's typically no issues with that at all. I'm not certain about the forms. Uh, we haven't tried it yet. Um, if the forms uh, requires the cell service, then it's probably going to motivate um, an investment into a farm-wide Wi-Fi <laughs> because we generally have pretty good internet service, but um, but it it really could uh, motivate a, a, a change so that we've got better service uh, in the in the calving area. Um, how are you storing your data, and do you have access to different people at the same time and place? Have you got to try that out, Tyler? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the Google Sheet is where the, all of the data is stored. Um, it's a, you kind of have to think out, think of it in a different way. Um, it's, it's, and it's, it's not limited to, to Google only. It's, there's other cloud-based systems that effectively every time you input the data, it goes into um, a, a file that's, um, that's shared by you know whoever you want to share it with, um, and it's accessible in real time. And so um, it was kind of funny uh, when my daughter was putting in inputting the data. One time I was out in the field um, looking at looking at the same sheet, and I could see her inputting like the data being input as I was out in the field. Um, so it's, uh, it's a little bit different way of thinking about it. We always went, we, we used to go with an Excel file and then every time we updated it, we emailed it out to everybody that worked well. Um, but this works better. Perfect. Uh, also for Tyler, does your scale and tag reader input readings automatically into your spreadsheet or do you have to input it manually? Yeah, that's definitely um, that's definitely a want for us. Uh, our scale does not. It's uh, it's a twenty five year old scale, um, and so we are punching in the information. Uh, depending on the weather, sometimes we'll write it down on a piece of paper and then and then transcribe it. 
Um, I'd love to have a new scale head with uh, that connected uh, via Bluetooth or something like that. It would be, um, I think that's probably um, on the list for the next year or two, but the you know, they're expensive. And so it's a trade off between, well, a little bit labor, more labor intensive um, and, uh, and less convenient, um, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. I know the technology is out there, um, but uh, we don't currently do that. And our, our RFID reader, um, I think has some basic uh, software, but it's not one that we use and it's not connected to our scale head. Okay, um, a question here about uh, software, uh, but Tyler, Google Sheet versus cattle management software, such as um, when it, the example here is Cattle Max, um, how would you compare using Google Sheets to using other software that you've had to pay for or use in the past? So um, we, I've never, uh, I've tried out, I think, three different softwares um, and was pretty motivated to, uh, to, to use one. Um, and cattle, uh, sorry, uh, I think, was it Cattle Ma uh, Max? Was that the one that was mentioned? That think, was the one mentioned, yeah. Um, I did try that one and it just didn't, uh, it wasn't a, a, a perfect fit. I mean, it was like we were capturing things that, um, that it didn't have fields quite for and, um, and it was a little bit cumbersome. Um, the, there was another one that, uh, that was being developed um, more recently, I think out of, uh, out of Alberta, and it may have even had some dollars from, um, from CCA or maybe BCRC. I'm not, I'm not a hundred, hundred percent sure. Uh, that one looked really good, especially, um, and the name escapes me, but the, uh, the, an the analytics on it was really cool. But to be honest, I just wasn't really willing to pay the price. I think it was going to cost us something in the neighborhood of around, you know, $1,500 or something like that. And um, I'm kind of cheap, you know, I just didn't, I didn't feel like it was bringing enough to the, to the table. Um, so with the forms, I think, and the Google Sheet and the, the ability to be able to reference it wherever and to customize it however we want, um, I'm, I don't see us probably moving away from, from the Google Sheet option anytime soon. But I know that there are good, um, there are good programs out there that people swear by. And, and I think if it fits your operation, um, the, the main thing is, just using it and learning all aspects to, to really leverage it. Perfect. I think this question could be for Kathy or Tyler. Um, what is standard protocol for taking weights with regard to letting calves stand for weighing? And if I want to track it over time, what is the appropriate length of time before weighing again? Kathy. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'll uh, hopefully show up here. Um, you know, Christine, that's a, I see the, the name here for the, for the question. And what I think about that for in terms of academia is that, you know, you want to try, you're going to, you're worrying about gut fill in those calves. If you can weigh them earlier in the day, do that. I think about the time that what we do at the Western Beef Development Center and the Livestock Forage Center of Excellence. Lots of times we do two day weights so that we have, and we average those weights. That's probably not within the realm of feasibility for a producer. So if you can get them weighed earlier in the day, or if you're consistently weighing at the same time each, uh, you know, is it, that will help if you're doing these weights. Um, how frequent um, every, um, you know, every, month maybe you're doing it as you're tracking it. I'm not sure exactly what type of animal you're thinking of. Is it a background or what have you? Uh, we try and do weights at the, the research center um, every two weeks, um, but I guess it's going to have to be with how often you're handling them. I'd be interested to hear, Tyler, if you're just taking a weight at birth, and then I know you had said that your weight isn't exactly at weaning. It's, it's typically a couple weeks before. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, we also background our calves uh, as well. And typically, uh, if we have a, yeah, if we have an idea as to 
if we have some concerns about uh, about rate of gain, about the ration or something, that's when we might um, we might run you know a, a handful through just to just to be able, excuse me, get some perspective as to what the gains are, and and typically it's got to be a group large enough that it would be representative of uh, of all of them. Um, as far as uh, you know, day of you know timing, we we just. Uh, we always try to be consistent uh, with it. Um, all, we'll always be weighing our animals before we do any marketing, whether it's in the in the fall or or the spring. Um, and we're trying to, I, I guess, take into consideration, um, you know, what we want to get as close as we can because we're listing those animals as a certain weight, and so we got to have uh, our rate of gain figured out. We have to have that shrink. Uh, at least pretty much figured out and um, you know and it, and it reflects upon us if the if there's a big divergence from what we've said the animals were to um, what they actually end up weighing uh, on sale day. Okay we just got a bunch of more questions just rolling here. Um, uh, Tyler, if there was one measurement that you were not making or not able to measure, uh, but you would like to do, what would that be? Do you have any? Well, I think we're probably falling a bit short on, uh, on pasture management um, stuff. Uh, I would, I mean, I would love to be able to uh, to get some per better perspective as to, you know, the impacts of gains based on grazing period, um, you know, stock density and, and so on. Um, but we're, you know, we're not doing that. It's typically, you know, the scale isn't there. It's not, you know, we don't have a corral handy, that type of thing. Uh, when they're in their paddocks, um, we do have, you know, some, some easy, you know, meager means of being able to capture them, but uh, it, it typically isn't, it's not getting done typically in the summertime. And so that's probably what I would like to measure. And it probably would, I suspect, in, um, lead us to building more cross fencing. <laughs> okay, I think we'll just ask one more question here. There's been lots of great questions this evening. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the Google Sheets, um, and there's some questions about whether there's examples of um, records like yours, Tyler, uh, available for free on the net. Um, and Kathy, feel free to chime in there as well. I know you were doing some work with the Google Sheets as well recently. Yeah, what I'll maybe do, um, I, after having a little run through just a couple of days ago with Tyler to see the form he developed, I went and spent a bit of time just creating another example form with for for a calving record and then it it will deposit into um, a sh uh, worksheet much like what Tyler's just showing. I'm prepared to share that with everybody for free and you can go in and, and have a copy of it that you save to your own Google Drive account and modify it as you wish. Um, and we can make that link available to everybody when when Ellen sends out the recording of this presentation. I'm I, That's fine with me for, for you that want to have something to start with and then you can modify it to your own needs. Um, but that'll just be for calving records. Obviously, Tyler showed a whole pile of different um, worksheets that he's developed, and that's something that, um, if you're looking for templates, uh, we can I can definitely work some things up with you. I know that the uh, provincial government here in Saskatchewan has been working with producers to develop uh, template tools for them within Excel, though, is my understanding. Yeah. Um... I, I really think it just takes a little bit of time to, you know, to sit down and and mess around with it a little bit. Um, I would say we I'd be willing to to share, you know, the template that we have um, to anybody really that that wants it. It's uh, it's really straightforward. Um, and then you can make it your own if you want it. So um, my email address was on uh, earlier in the uh, in, uh, on my uh, title slide there, 
um, and um, and you can you can uh, you can just contact me, and I can uh, can strip out some of our data, and and uh, and then maybe you can use it as your own. But um, it's really that's the benefit of the of Google Sheets. You can make it whatever you know whatever you want it to be, and as detailed or as uh, broad as you want. Excellent. So just some closing remarks before everybody goes here. One is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. Go to our website, beefresearch.ca and click on the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook or YouTube account, you can connect with us there. I also wanted to mention before everybody goes, we have a survey that is currently open, the Research and Technology Transfer Strategy uh, survey. Um, it is available through beefresearch.ca um, and your input is important. It takes about 15 minutes and you can have your say in uh, the research priorities for the Canadian beef industry. And don't miss our next webinar on breeding goals, practical genetics for beef production. That will be on February 17th. Our speakers will be Sean McGrath and Lance Leachman. You'll receive an email from me, hopefully tomorrow, with a link to watch the recording from this webinar, as well as links to some additional information. So like Kathy said, a link to the Google Sheets and some links to the resources that are available on beefresearch.ca and some other good stuff in there as well. You'll also receive a link to a survey to fill out. Um, you may also receive a link to the survey once you close this webinar window. If you can take a moment to fill that out, that helps us with developing future webinars and we'd really appreciate taking your time to do that. So that's it. Uh, thank you to Tyler and Kathy for volunteering your time to help us out this evening. And thank you to all of you joining us this evening and good night. <laughs>